With Watcher Pro 21, Intermorphic have added a brand new reverb unit to the ISE. This unit is incredibly powerful and is capable of delivering a huge range of reverbs from a simple subtle ambience to really show-stopping headline effects. But with great power comes an awful lot of parameters and at first sight Reverb 2 can be quite intimidating. So I'm going to use this video to talk through each of the parameters and try and explain what they do, which means I'm afraid there's a lot of talking coming up. First of all, it's probably best if I give an overview of the various sections that make up this reverb and describe briefly what they do before diving into each section in detail. Running from left to right, we have an input section, which is where you have some tweaks for you to shape up the signal going into the reverb unit. And that feeds into a pre-delay section. Now this is a simple variable delay that has to complete before the signal feeds into the reverb proper. So what's the point of that? If you imagine standing in a real reverberant space and clap your hands, the sound takes time to travel from your hands to the walls of the space and then back to your ears. If the time that takes is very short, your brain will tell you that you're in quite a small room. But the longer the sound takes to get back to you, the bigger the space will sound. So pre-delay is a useful way to suggest the size of the space you want the reverb to emulate. With very long pre-delay times, the reverb can start to sound very unnatural, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Also, as a top tip, if your mixes are starting to sound a bit muddy, a few milliseconds of pre-delay can really help to clean them up, especially when the source sounds have a fast attack. If you dial in a small pre-delay, say start around 10 milliseconds, the attack phase of the source has time to establish itself before the reverb kicks in proper, and that can really sharpen the sound up a lot. After the pre-delay, the next stage is the early reflection stage. In your real reverberant spaces, these are the first reflections you hear, usually coming back from the surfaces that are closest to your ears. Early reflections tend to be quite clean sounding and they also give the brain clues about the size and the reflective nature of the space you're in. After the early reflections comes the late reverb and this is the meat of the sound. This is the sound of complex reflections where the source sound has bounced around the surfaces of the space which scatter and absorb sound in all manner of complex ways. And finally the output section is where you mix the sounds from all the previous stages, combining the dry with the pre-delay, the early reflections and the late reverb. And this is also a place where you can apply some basic equalisation to the output with both high and low shell filters as well as a low pass filter. Now let's step through the actual unit in Watcher and look at all the parameters in turn. First of all, I should say that unlike the block diagram, the unit in Watcher puts the inputs and the output section together at the top of the display. This is for ergonomic reasons, because they are the controls you'll want to use most often, so it makes sense to have the output mixer and the EQ somewhere that you don't need to scroll down to. But the rest of the unit is laid out in the same way as the block diagram. So, from the top we have the input section. The cross-blend control determines how much mixing there is of the stereo input. At minimum, the left and right channels are processed separately, in parallel, through the reverb. So if you are ping-ponging the source audio around, the minimum setting will maintain that ping-pong effect for you. As you increase the slider, increasing amounts of the left channel are mixed with the right channel and vice versa, until at maximum you'll have pretty much a mono signal going in. The pre-delay does what it says. The low and high cuts are very basic controls for adjusting the tone of the input signal if you need to do that. For example, reverb can often get muddy with the low frequency content, so it can be useful to prevent that by using the low cut to hold back some of the lower frequencies from going through the reverb process at all. I'll come back to the output section later, but for now, as you can see, the audio from the input can be mixed to the final output if you want it to. From the inputs, we move to the early reflections unit. This unit divides into two parts, a delay section and a diffusion section. 
And this is where things start to get complicated, so you'll need to bear with me for a bit. The early reflection delay section is a simple fixed length delay. The overall delay time is 500 milliseconds. But inside that fixed delay time, we can define multiple taps. A tap is simply something that pulls the audio out from the delay at some point before its end point. So each tap is going to be a subdivision of the 500 milliseconds overall delay time. Now we can have up to 50 taps out from this delay, but this is where things start to get a bit fuzzy. Because one of the features of this particular reverb unit is that some parameters are generated randomly. Now down here at the bottom, you'll see a parameter called tap seed. This is a randomizer. It's a dice roll. This seed determines the number of taps and their gain. So it's something to experiment with. Different values here will give subtly different sonic results. Once you've found a value that works for you, saving the preset or saving the entire watcher file will lock that value in. So next time you open the file, the number of taps will be the same, unless you reseed it. So, having said all that, this taps count slider at the top doesn't actually decide how many taps you have. It simply determines how many of the available taps you want to use. None, all, or somewhere in the middle. But the actual number of taps is generated randomly from the tap seed. The tap length slider concerns how long each tap lasts. Very short times will make for quite distinct echoes, whereas longer times will blur and overlap with each other more, depending on how many taps you've got. The tap gain slider is a mixer control which balances the dry signal with the tap outputs. At minimum, the output is 100% dry, so you won't hear any of the taps at all. And at maximum, you hear just the taps, no dry signal. The decay slider controls how the taps fade out once they've completed. Again, with very low settings, you'll find the taps are quite distinct e echoes. Higher values cause this effect to be more blurred. The next part of the early reflections section is the diffuser. It's enabled by default, but it can be turned off. And if you want to experiment with the tap delay section on its own, disabling the diffuser is a really good way to explore the tap section and see what it does in isolation. The diffuser is a kind of a mini reverb section in that it diffuses and softens the hard edge sound of the tap delay. So if you want sharp sounding hard edge reverb with very clear early reflections, turn it off. However, this section also uses a random seed to set many of the under the hood parameters. So playing with that can also throw up quite harsh metallic edge sounds or very soft mellow sounds. It really is roll of the dice and an experiment. The stages slider determines how many filters in series are used by the diffuser, from a minimum of one to a maximum of 12. Generally speaking, more filters equals a smoother sound. The delay slider controls the delay between the filters. Shorter values will usually sound brighter than longer values here. The feedback slider effectively controls the sound of the decay of the filter system. Higher values give longer decay times. Now each of the filters that's in use have a built-in LFO that can modulate its centre frequency. The modulation amount and the modulation rate sliders control the depth and speed of that modulation. Setting them to zero gives you a brighter sounding output. Small values will give you subtle variations to the early reflections. Large values will give you an almost chorus-like effect. The parameters of the late reverberator stage are almost identical to the early reflections. The structural difference is that here, the delays and the filters are in parallel, not in series. And there's also an option to put the delay section either before or after the filters. By default, the delay section comes before the filters. 
but if you like you can switch it so that it comes after the filters. This tends to give a thicker sounding reverb but with a much more pronounced delay effect. Again, experiment, see which one you like. So, from the top, in the delay section, we have a slider to determine how many delay lines are in play. The time slider controls the time of the main delay and the line decay controls the range at which those delays fade. Now, of all the controls in the unit, line decay is the one that corresponds most closely to the global decay rate setting you find on most other reverbs. So large values here will give you something close to, well very close to a frozen or infinite reverb. The modulator controls affect the modulation of the main delay times. So large values here will produce very dramatic, rather queasy pitch changing effects. More subtle levels again produce nice chorusing or phaser like effects. And, like the other units, under the hood parameters are determined by random seeding. So play with that and the character will change. And lastly, the diffuser is a network of up to 12 filters in parallel, with the same range of controls we saw in the early reflections section. And, as before, low values here will tend to make brighter, clearer reverb sounds, and becoming more indistinct and diffused as the values increase. Tracking back to the top takes us now to the output section, which hopefully makes more sense. Firstly, we have a simple mixer, where you can mix the outputs of the various discrete sections of the reverb chain. Dry out and late out are the two major controls. Adding the pre-delay and early reflection outputs can help clarity and help define the sonic qualities of the reverb, but like most things, how you use them is going to be very dependent on the effect you're seeking and the input that you're using. The equalisation section is incredibly important. I really can't overstate how major an impact it has on toning up and shaping the final quality of the reverb. So if you haven't paid attention to much else, this bit is important. Here we've got a low shelf and a high shelf filter with their respective frequency and gain controls. The frequency sliders run from the lowest frequency to the highest, so if you have both sections enabled, their most transparent settings would be with the low shelf frequency set to a minimum, the high shelf frequency set to a maximum, and both gains set to maximum. The filter frequencies determine at which point in the spectrum the filters start to shelf off sonic content, and the gain slider determines how fierce this shelving is. Now I need to stress that both the gain sliders are concerned with applying gain reduction. So when they are set to maximum, no reduction is in force. They are effectively flat at that setting. As you bring the slider down from the maximum, the reduction in gain increases. So when the slider is at the far left, the gain reduction is at its maximum. So both of these shelf filters are at their most aggressive settings when the gain sliders are set to minimum, and it's quite possible to kill off all of the wet signal just using those two filters. So you need to take a bit of time to get used to how they behave, and in particular, remember that the gain sliders work in what seems to be the opposite way from how you might expect them to. The low pass filter is a simple first order filter and is best thought of as a basic tone control. It's quite useful for trimming the overall sound a bit, but high and low shelf filters have a far more dramatic effect on the sonic qualities of the reverb output. And finally, at last, we have a slider to control the apparent width of the stereo signal output. Again, this uses a randomizer to determine how left and right are processed. At the maximum setting, which is the default, the stereo effect will be at its widest. If you want a tighter, more focused soundstage image, then you use lower values. And finally, there's an option to turn interpolation on or off. This interpolates the final output, the wet output, and by default, and in most circumstances, you'd want to keep it on. If you turn it off, uh, there are some circumstances where you'll get a more a uh, sharp, brittle kind of sound with a digital edge, um, which can be really nice if um, you're looking for that particular effect from a reverb.
but you'll get smoother results by keeping the interpolation on. And finally, at the top, there's a bunch of presets that are built into the system uh, that you can use as starting points for your explanations. Have fun.